Kate, it's a real joy to have you um, in this conversation. It's always a joy for me to talk to someone. Uh, you, you live and teach at uh, Duke Divinity School. And so uh, as a native North Carolinian, that's always um, a great joy for me to talk <laughs> to someone there. But uh, but you didn't start there. That's not where you were born, right? I believe you were born in Canada. Oh, I am that kind of Canadian, too. I want it to come up this early in the conversation. So thank you, Neil. I appreciate that. It's my comfort zone. How did you end up where, how did you end up at Duke? I mean, how did you make yeah, your way there? It was kind of the never ending school program. It right. just kept happening. I had, when I was not uh, many Canadians go to American schools and uh, my parents had gone uh, to the UK for theirs. And I thought, and I, I mostly had a plan where I wanted to go to the same school that Anne of Green Gables went to, which right. turns out is not a real person. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, so, but I, 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 I learned mostly about American schools from American television shows. So Saturday okay. morning broadcasting, that's how I learned about the SATs from a show called Saved by the Bell. So right. thank you. Thank you, American <laughs> capitalism. You spread your gospel far and wide. Um, you know, speaking of things that we learn when we're growing up, there's all kinds of sayings that we orient our lives around. And um, sometimes we later think about them and oftentimes we carry them with us without much self-reflection and uh, we think they're always true. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe it's sort of like the book of Proverbs where some things might sound right when you're a child, but then when you become an adult, you know, not always depends on what's going on or uh, what context you put them in. But all these kinds of cliches, you know, there was a group here that uh, studied your previous book. Aww. Everything happens for a reason. Other lives I've loved. Um, and, I, and I think one of the things, you know, about that and what you're writing about now, just as people wrestle with that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it makes me think a lot about um, the way um, the Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann talks about the Psalms, about there's mm -hmm. Psalms of orientation when things seem right, there's mm -hmm. songs of disorientation when things aren't right, clearly, and then there's there's other Psalms on the other side of all of that. Yeah. So, you know, these things that we grow up with, how do you, um, you know, uh, how do you think about that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I maybe the first few that I may have internalized and not really had any good reason to call into question was I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. And I kind of assumed that meant um like getting great grades in math and mm -hmm. generally being able to uh overcome obstacles, you know, just the 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 sort of gentle ambitions and hungers that I had as someone who was young and a little dumb and lucky and, and didn't know it yet. And I had, I may have accidentally assumed that like Christianity was more deeply compatible with just being middle-class really had sort of high hopes there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I had, in fact, um, here at the, at, at the divinity school, I have a lovely project called the everything happens project. And we collect mugs that now feel heretical to us. And one is the, um, all, 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 through God, all things are possible, but it just, it's misspelled. So it just says, through God, all things are possible. And we're like, yeah, that, that is sort of how it feels sometimes. It's not really possible. It's just possible. Right. Um, you know, and thinking about not only how we kind of navigate life, um, you know, with some of these sayings, but even, even our worship spaces. Um, yeah. I, one of the things I've always loved about the tradition that I, that I'm in, the Anglican tradition is that the Psalms are a part of daily prayer and part of our common life. And it's often common when you need to squeeze things out to cut it out. And I, I've, I have found that in every place I've been, I try to put that back in, even if we take yeah. something else out, partly for this reason of yeah. learning and give, being given permission to look at the world in all the different ways we look at it, when we're happy yes. and when we're angry and when we're sad. Um, and I feel like when that gets taken out of people's hands, that that's really not helping them. Yeah. Um, Oh, bless you for doing that. That is, it is hard to convince us as people of faith that we are allowed to have a wide spectrum of, right. of spiritual feelings, feelings about God, feelings about fear, feelings about whether hope for our lives is the same thing as the confidence of just having had things already work out. I mean, it is, it is, it, I think it feels confusing because it is confusing. So giving, I think that's wonderful that you offer a wider, a wider lens than I, than I, I found. I, 
I grew up with a form of, um, well, mostly among Mennonites who are mm -hmm. quite wonderful at um, very low expectations. They're like, look, we mostly drained the swamps by hand, which they did. <laughs> they really did. And they, um, you know, they can just ruin food with jello at any time. Uh, <laughs> but they are, they are wonderful at corporate suffering, but they, they are, um, they really do keep a tight lid on their expectations. And so they, they're sort of wonderful at the bottom half, I think of the spiritual register, mm -hmm. but, but they're, they're tough. If they need a miracle, you can tell culturally, it's very hard for them to say, um, God is, 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 is there a miracle in here for me? Is there God, would it be okay if I raised my expectations for just a moment? Well, thinking about those kind of moments those crucible moments. Um, when you were 35 years old, you faced this really grim news about your own health. Uh, yeah. And I mean, it wasn't just yeah. the medium button. It was like all the way stage four cancer. Yeah. Um, and you describe it in the, the, book that you've just it's been released within days uh it's not it's brand new um that you were a ticking clock and um you said that these thoughts uh were moments that you know, seem like minutes uh mm -hmm. um and what did you mean by about sort of how that worked for you in terms mm -hmm. of the clock and how you mm -hmm. perceived that yeah i guess i had always um lived a little bit in in middle distance, like in the not quite future, mm -hmm. where I was always like doing something and going somewhere and trying to get something done. And there, I think there was a paradigm there that I, that was not um, terribly Christian, though I imagined it to be, but it was part of this American culture of efficiency and time management right. and something about inboxes and <laughs> work weeks and mastering my morning and I assumed that life was a thing that you can get done right. and that I almost honestly, my best friend always teases me that I, I inadvertently treat every 24 hours as if there's like a giant reset button that's pressed when it's supposed to wake up in the morning and be like, ta-da, fresh and new. I mean, like instead I'm, you know, exhausted or scared or sad or, um, that time wasn't really time. And, uh, it was just intervals as if like I was a grid and I, I was very good at that life until I got cancer so suddenly. And it, uh, there was no premonition of it. There was no cancer in my family. There was no sense that uh, my life would be the one that was undone. Like everybody right. always knows somebody, especially when you're, until you age into it, everybody kind of has a little handful of stories of people whose lives catastrophically blew up. But then you don't ever really imagine that it's you. And, sure. Um, and then I, uh, the second I got sick, I felt the same feeling, but as a kind of like tick, tick, tick of cancer and my own finitude and limitations. And instead of, I'd like to say, I was like, look, you know, I, at that moment I slowed down and I, <laughs> I realized that there was a different way of living. No, I, I felt, uh, I felt terrified and panicked. Like I needed to speed up to get done in a life, what I imagined a full life was supposed to be. And so um, all the things yeah. that mattered to me, I just felt like, oh, no, no, maybe I, yeah, maybe they were just minutes. I was going to ask you about your sense of time, because that comes up in this memoir and about how to spend your precious time. And I, I, I was thinking about last year, um, I turned 50. And I told a Bible study here, I said, now, you know, it's a funny thing. I thought of something from that day and then the days after that it was just as true the day before. But yeah. I, I was hyper aware of the fact, well, you know, there's probably more sand in the bottom part of the hourglass than there is in the top. And it wasn't a terrible thing. It was just like, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, oh, yeah it was, I know. But, it was, but the thing was, it was true yesterday, yeah. too. Probably. Yes. No, and, I uh, know. But then you're in a different, but then you're suddenly... Yeah. Fast forward and you're thinking about that in a different way. I think our being also, you know, with your skin, I mean, come on, mm -hmm. you could yeah. be any age. It's well done. <laughs> well done, you. And I, I do think that the idea of our limitations do feel impossible. Mm -hmm. Like, like people, like as if, um, 
you know, like the old show, this is, what is it? This is your life where there's like behind every door is a different person. Someone could just yeah. pop in and be like, you're 70. And I'm like, really? Like, I, had no, I had no understanding of time, but we could, sometimes we feel we could be any age. We could have right. we, no, no sense of our, our ends because, because our, that for some reason, that is not a gift God gave us is the ability to imagine ourselves as, um, as being able to end, but certainly there's a perversion of it that American culture has become, especially, uh, intoxicated by. And that is not just that we can't picture our ends, but that we are invincible and that Mm -hmm. we are unlimited and we should all just be headed toward like Walt Disney cryogenic style, right. (laughs) Freezing and perpetuity. I mean, we uh, we have i mean we as christians should be great at thinking about ourselves in relationship with time but i think i think we like everyone else just kind of it, it feels either impossible or very fuzzy i mean so did you um when you were like overwhelmed with all of that initially um do you feel like i mean the time become more precious to you or did it seem more fleeting or how does all that kind of weave together or was it all different hours you know of each day i'm going to give you my most honest answer even though it feels all very embarrassing but uh remember that 60s remember the solid gold collection (laughs) remember that that they used to send to sell those like tape sets i had all those memorized and there was that one song that was like the why do the birds keep on singing which is somebody has been broken up with and it's not going well for them Mm -hmm. that day Um, but every, every morning I would wake up and I would forget for a minute that it was me. And then I would remember all over again. And in that moment, it like, it just broke my heart. Yeah. And, uh, and then it was me. And then there was, um, a couple wonderful things about the way that, that I, that, that time works. I think anybody who's been through a tragedy understands that bit of it, which is, it's tragic time. It's like a loop. Everything feels like it's in a loop. Mm-hmm. Today could be any day. It's not Tuesday anymore. It's tragic time. And sometimes, like it did for me, it felt almost beautiful and crisp because it felt so fleeting. Mm-hmm. And I was at that moment, I I honestly would say or do anything. I mean, just uh, because tomorrow wasn't, didn't matter. I... I remember at one point when I thought I was like ready for polite company, I got up from a, like a business lunch, like an academic kind of, and I just, I just like got up in the appetizer time and was like, I don't, I don't have time for this. I just right. like walked, like I, you know, the sense you could bulldoze anything. Sure. Um, but also that um, in moments like that, I have experienced God's love so intensely right. in a way that also really didn't make any sense. So the, yeah, that, that has been like the surrealness of tragic time has always stood out to me as having a very different quality of experience. And I recognize it in other people. Sure. They've had this huge kind of simultaneous preciousness, but also like, screw it. Well, (laughs) that's a good segue into, so in your book, when you're talking about, you you open with this moment that you're facing, um, and there were two parts of your describing, I guess that not your first visit to the hospital, but this moment where you really are aware of, of what's in front of you. Yeah. And the first thing is, uh, I'm sure lots of people listening to this webinar in their own vocations have some version of this. You, you actually enacted something that uh, certainly a lot of clergy maybe have imagined doing or maybe have done secretly in certain ways. But when you went into the hospital bookshop, Yes. And you were you were um, in a state of mind, uh, and you were confronted with some things. You actually did something, uh, you know, yeah. in a way I that a, people imagine doing, but they don't really do. What'd you do? I had a, yeah, I had a moment. <laughs> I had a moment where I lost my mind, and yeah. I and I, you know, I had spent a decade of my life writing a very, very, very polite history of the American prosperity gospel, mm-hmm. which is to say the belief that if you have a certain kind of faith, that God will reward you with health and wealth and happiness. And it was, it was, a, it, I was compassionate and loving, and I feel like I have done a good job 
with coexisting in a Joel Osteen best life now world. Sure. With respect and love, but not that day, Neil, not that day. Right. I was in my hospital gown and my little IV pole because they were letting me practice walking down the hallway. And then I found the elevator and I was like, done. So I went down to the lobby and I saw a book display that I'm sure I had seen before. And it was just all these copies of Joel Osteen's. It was either like Best Life Now or Every Day a Friday or something like that. And I, um, I just felt like uh, we could all do better. So I went in and just started helpfully removing them from the shelf and then putting them on the ground and then just gently kicking them with my feet to the side before the hospital bookstore manager came out and was just like, ma'am. <laughs> and I was like, look, I swear. It was like a hostage negotiation where I was like, ma'am, I... I swear I am not unstable. I right. swear I, uh, I'm actually an expert in this. I work <laughs> here, not here in the hospital, but here at Duke University. And uh, you can't, you can't sell this to me. I said it with like, it was a personal because it was personal for the first time. And then she was like, oh, it, isn't it a New York Times bestseller? And I was like, I was like, look, so I, I bartered a little and then tried to, I was like, I'll just, I thought I could just provide a very helpful list of books that say didn't actively blame people for their own disease Thanks. by not harnessing right. their positive mindset. Right. And, uh, but by the time I, I came back, uh, the, the bookshelf had been reassembled with <laughs> copies of the next book. You, Joel Osteen's, you can, you will. <laughs> <laughs> I want to come back to that in just a moment, but there was one other thing about that time you were in the hospital that really struck me and, and probably from the seat that I sit in sometimes in other settings, but, um, mm -hmm. You were you were trying to get some information about uh, detail about what you were really facing, and there's always kind of a smoothing out of like not really wanting to give you the full um, detail. But you said um, when you were talking to this doctor, who was more like a peer of yours, you know. So He's there's like one a thing, twelve year old, yeah. As you said, when you said you you were both too young to be de dealing with what you were talking about, and you said I kept my voice invitational. I will not shoot this messenger because you wanted to know something, but you were aware of kind of how those moments can unravel or whatever. But that really yeah. struck me about, you know, um, mm -hmm. he was struggling too <laughs> in a different way. Yeah. But, um, can you describe a little bit of that, how you thought about yeah. that or navigated that? Yeah. Well, cause I, I came out of surgery and I, you know, and everyone who comes out of surgery is just not really in their bodies yet, but they're mm -hmm. not really anywhere. And, um, and I realized I didn't know anything. I didn't really know what they were talking about. They kept saying legions, legions. And I just hadn't, I honestly didn't. Right. I, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't Googled it. I couldn't, I just kind of had this vague sense that I was a spaghetti bowl of cancer somehow. And the whole thing just felt absolutely ridiculous. And impossible to think about. And, uh, so when a doctor came in, I probably just to check my bandages or something. I was, I, I realized that I, I didn't even know, um, what it meant. And that has always been, I think one of the great chasms between patients and, um, and doctors in particular, I feel like nurses, they live in that space between. So, but what doctors is, um, is sometimes an inability that they're, they're trained into a way of speaking in which they can reply with, um, num they can reply with a kind of precision that doesn't really let you ask, but what does it mean? And, um, so I, I was trying to figure out like, wait, what are, what are lesions? Oh, oh, you mean tumors? Oh, well, I was like, wait, nobody's told me if I'm going to live. Right. And I just looked so uncomfortable. And, um, and then I think he responded with, um, I can only tell you what the probability rates are for a person like you with your diagnosis. Just like these little loops that everybody. And so I, so he said, you have a 14% a chance of living. And then apparently I just grabbed him, like just grabbed his arm. And I was like, you better, you've got to be holding my hand if you're going to say something like that. And I think um, I saw him, you know, and I, I've met so many doctors since but it is so hard in these really tender, shockingly intimate moments in healthcare settings in which we sometimes are ill-equipped to deal with the, the full weight of each other's humanity. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. The, you know, going back to the, um, you know, sort of the power of positive thinking, you know, and you, you've reflected a lot on that. Um, it's such an American gospel and it, and it comes in different forms. I mean, they're conservative forms or Pentecostal forms or liberal forms. Um, you know, I'm sitting here in Houston, not that far away from Joel Osteen's church. Uh, uh, when I was in, I was at Bruton Parish in Williamsburg, Virginia one time, and I was, I got to preach. Uh, we had a guest in church one Sunday. It was Robert Schuler, who was in town having his oil portrait made and got to have lunch with him afterwards. But it was, okay. you know, it's really an interesting conversation with someone yeah. like that, who's a liberal version in a way, uh, of, yes. but, but not all that different in some ways. Uh, what? No. Not in oh, any I'm, way different. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. And later we can talk about hope. You know, sometimes hope we confuse with wish or optimism or something like that. And of course, American Americans are optimistic and it's, you know, can be one of the great things about us and all. But when it gets all confused, you know, um, yeah. and kind of our religious faith kind of gets entangled in it and how we perceive suffering in the world. Um, mm-hmm. How do you help people untangle those knots? Mm. I think hope is one of the hardest mm-hmm bits of all. And it has taken me a long time to really even know what I mean by hope because Mm -hmm. um, all the early forms seem to me to be different expressions of uh, formulas that people were wanting me to be confident in. So because I had a dramatic illness and also I, I have studied faith healing for most of my life. So I've been to hundreds and hundreds of services that that have that cultivate expectation mm-hmm. of miracles in the form of a demand. God, I am petitioning you, and then you must, and my faith will bear this out. And so mostly I'd seen faith as a kind of certainty. And then there's reformed versions where God has a plan meant was equated with the same thing as saying, um, and you must discover that plan and you will know that plan. And then the, the the inherent meaning of your life will rise to the surface if you're doing this right, if you're suffering right, if you're, and that felt really like a lot to freight, like a young mom with as she's just mm-hmm. mostly trying to figure out how to, how to love the people that she's entrusted with when her future has been taken away. And, um, and how, I guess I, the other bit I thought hope was some sort of a way when sometimes when people would say, well, you just need to have faith. And sometimes that meant, I think, um, that either um, the next life was going to be wonderful and therefore it should make the present entirely bearable or, but I kept, I always remember I'd saying like faith in God to do what? Like, I actually don't have any relationships in which I don't have expectations of people. Like we showed up here today at a certain set of times we've created and built trust because that's right. because that's how we're wired. And so if I am having to let go of a lot of certainties, like what does hope even mean in that context? And I tried to get out of it for a long time, honestly, but then my beautiful colleagues here at divinity school was like, oh no, sweetie, like you, can't, you, you can't pick these other forms of courage, but no hope because that's stoicism or different forms of Buddhism and we're Christians. So I the language that I came to realize really felt true was that hope is this is the future that God places before us, like an anchor just dropped in the future. And God is pulling us toward God. God is telling us a story in which the future will be saved. And one day there will be no more pain. And that, and that hope is a story about the love and the salvation of all of us, but that's not necessarily the same thing as saying that, that my life is going to work out in the way that I hoped it would. I do think, yeah. I, and I think a lot of Americans really do use hope as a synonym for wish. Yeah. Or confidence. Not really the same. Yeah. Or yeah. an overconfidence or something, um, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. But in thinking about the, you know, the, the positivity thing, um, I remember my wife was reading a book once about, you know, someone who was facing cancer and, it was essentially kicked out of a support group because bringing the group down, you know, you know, oh, like, I mean, it's, yeah. but it's an interesting thing to think about if people cannot, um, yeah. you know, um, include, um, yeah. the things aren't always getting better and better every day in every way for everybody. Yes. Uh, yes. It is very, uh, hard. my wife just put a message here. It was the, uh, 
it was the bright bright sided by Barbara Eric Aaron Rick. On yeah, Aaron Rick. Uh, She's Rick, a yeah. uh, bright sided is a, a lovely term um, for this sort of I I would call it like an, an oppressive futurism. Sure. Um, but yeah, it is. Uh, it does prevent people from having all kinds of things. Like um, mm. makes us. It makes it impossible for us to say things like life is a chronic condition or that there are befores and afters and sometimes before was better Mm -hmm. and uh and that not every setback is a set up i mean all these sort of equations that try to draw lines through our lives and and tell us that freight one side the 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 whole thing about the what's god's plan for my life and that comes up a lot i was just talking with someone recently about this and i said well um you know I, I, you know, I know what people are kind of looking for when they, yeah. they're searching for meaning. And um, I, I have more and more frequently gone back to the notion in the Hebrew Bible about um, God is able to go. Well, first of all, God's present with us in our yes. suffering, but God is able to bring good out of evil uh, mm-hmm. without you know, ascribing the evil to the purpose of God. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah. and I always have to be very careful how I, any of these things, how I use language, but yeah, that's right. Uh, have you thought about that maybe differently or is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, a, there's just a bit there that I uh, feel very strongly about, you mm-hmm. know, that is mm-hmm. the, um, the bit I think that feels very hard to resist when we talk about it. And you said none of these things, mm-hmm. but these are the things I hear most often is, um, is that the very transactional language that this created right. that. And right. I think it's especially true when we say, like Frederick Buechner does. Um, this is the world, beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't right. be afraid, you know, even mm-hmm. though I'd be like, we should probably be afraid. Well. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I think the beautiful and the terrible is really where I, I feel like I've landed theologically is so much of the, I mean, cancer was lots of things in my life, but it was a massive humbler. And it wasn't, it really cracked me open to the, the realization that none of that was particularly special, that we're all this way. We're all just so fragile and that our lives are largely constituted by things we don't choose. And once I knew that, (laughs) oh, oh, and so it does feel easier for me um, to say, and this is mostly what we kind of based the the podcast on to just be like, everything happens period was that was trying to find ways of talking about the beauty and the meaning and the truth without reverting to, um, better than before. And, 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 and therefore it's worth it. I'm glad I went through it. I don't want a single person right. to have to sure. look at the, the the moments of their great undoing and be like, I'm so well, I'm so, I guess I have to say, I'm so glad I went through it because otherwise I wouldn't have this perspective. I'd like to think, you know, that I could have just watched a series of documentaries <laughs> about how sometimes people go through really hard things. <laughs> and I'm, and through the process of sanctification might have become something a little bit like this. Do you, do you think American Christians have a hard time? Again, I, I sort of looking back to kind of how things are presented in the Hebrew Bible, but um, there's this sense that, you know, A, God's with us through our suffering, but mm-hmm. And there are things, there's kind of a movement, but it's a collective movement over time and generations. So an individual life within that yeah. can't see, you can't see what's happening necessarily. And yeah. that American Christians, a lot of us want all of that compressed into our lifetime. Yeah, um, I totally. As opposed to whatever, you know, whether it's your children inheriting something that you you gave them, a way to look at the world or your friendships that you nurtured and the way they interact with other people, that you're yeah. part of this larger picture that's framed yeah. by, by your Christian faith. That's a beautiful way of putting it. I would love to feel like I'm part of a bigger picture that's being framed. Instead, I think I mostly blame the 1970s for mm-hmm. our extended delusional sense of adolescence, that there should always be a future before us. And that is partly in the marketing of youth culture it's mm-hmm. in our, it's now, offic- it's, it's institutionalized now in our social media, but it's been, I mean, ever since the boomer generation experienced that flush of capitalism in a certain way, 
it has felt like even though the economy has gone up and down, even though we've had a global earth plague that we're always supposed to be getting back to that feeling that are that we've got the wind in our sails. Mm-hmm. I was as a child of the 70s, I always think about uh, one little footnote to all that kind of optimism. And I think maybe, you know, probably per self-perception was you know, we're very scientific age and that kind of thing. But the memory I always think of is uh, camping at Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina, and then in the 70s, kids riding their bikes behind and running behind the mosquito sprayers. And I thought, I always think back to that. Like, <laughs> oh, no. I don't think we really understood all the things we needed to understand, but that seemed perfectly normal and acceptable back then. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, uh, we didn't optimize our, always optimize everything scientifically. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, on your podcast, uh, Everything Happens, you talk with uh, people who found hope and beauty and meaning and in, in the midst of their own tragedies. And so what surprised you as you listened to other people's stories? Yeah, and I and that's really where I what I needed right away immediately because the second I was my life was more terrible than I was prepared to quantify. Mm-hmm. I um I think there's this sort of accidental narcissism of pain where we get stuck into believing that it's only happening to us. Of course it isn't. Right. Um and of course our pain is precious and valuable because it is like our it is our absurd wonderful lives, but I needed other people. I needed the language. And I think that's kind of what has been the biggest gift is in these interviews is um, I always feel like I walk away with a little term that helps that create a greater space in, in between the sort of everything is possible and the nothing is possible that I'm, I'm right. getting more and more language for sure. limited agency. Mm-hmm. And that feels uh, just delicious to me. I, um, I, I, because it's, it's, it's such a wide range of people. It's people with kids with special needs or caregiving adults, or, oh my gosh, so many nurses and, um, Mm -hmm. people with unfixable lives of every kind, divorce, uh, just depression, anxiety, and, and none of it feels depressing. All of it just feels like the ability to and this is my prayer is like, just God, let me see things, how they really are. Just like, mm-hmm. let me, let me see the world a little more clearly. And these little, so like, for instance, um, one of the most beautiful beginning of the podcast season that, that began with the pandemic, I, I remember interviewing this incredible nurse who'd gone, who came out of retirement from nursing when the pandemic struck and it was those awful first days of Mm -hmm. scrubbing down and stripping down your clothes and drawing up last will and testament papers. And I mean, healthcare providers Mm -hmm. have just right. The world that the, the, the the world they have lived in is um, been unbearable. And so she just like marches back in and um, she was, you know, she was in charge of Um, mediating as in trying to find an ecumenical solution to the problem of chaplaincy when, when loved ones couldn't be with others while they're dying. Right. What an incredible. And so she's got, you know, um, a multi-faith panel of people and trying to figure out how can we stand in for one another because we can't all be everywhere. And you're going to have to have somebody you don't theologically agree with hold your person's hand. And, um, and I said, you know, and she's talking about, it was just such intimate, end of life work. And I was like, gosh, Christy, like, what is this? Like, like, what's your job? And I was thinking about pastors and church volunteers and like all the people who like Stephen's ministry and they just like show up for everybody. And I was like, gosh, like, what is your job? And she was like, oh, it's, it's the, it's the ability to love a stranger Mm -hmm. because I can't, I can't, if I can't love them, I can't serve them. Like I can't know them well enough to look, to serve them. I was like, well, that should be a thing we all right learn let's do that you know one of the things that's uh, unique about the setting where i'm at here at palmer is we're across the street from the largest medical center in the world and uh, there are moments like say a good friday service when the church is you know quiet and uh, solemn on the inside and then you open the doors of the church right Mm -hmm. after the liturgy and there's ambulances screaming down the yeah. You know, uh, Main Street uh, there, we're across Caddy Corner, across the intersection where Life Flight helicopters 
come all all the time every day it never stops and they come during the middle of our services and when we have services outdoors one of our services is outdoors right now and yeah they could be landing while we're in the middle of the eucharist you know it's just it, there's just a constant reminder of life and death and of people who are doing what you described um, loving strangers that they don't know and um, mm. uh, trying to bring healing where that's possible mm. uh, and being with present with people where that's not possible and so it's just constantly around us. Um, and so we do pray for the patients at the medical center because that's part of our, our parish. Uh, it's kind of an amazing thing to think about. But has, has your experience changed uh, the way that, you know, either you pray for yourself or really certainly how you, how you in that larger context, you're, you're more, I suppose, more aware now than you were of, of the suffering other people go through. Yeah. How has that affected you, like how you pray for people? Mm. Well, I, I, it feels it was one of the it was one of the privileges <clears throat> of studying faith healing for so long is um, I saw a lot of misuse of other people's hopes. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw a lot of wonder and playfulness and openness to a God that acts. And so uh, that was kind of one of the bits I wanted to keep was I love people who pray with boldness. I want to be one of those people who pray for the deep desires of our hearts to say, to not be embarrassed. Sometimes I felt, she said, loving and respectfully of the tradition in which I serve because I work in a Methodist setting mm -hmm. and go to Methodist churches here. And I sort of worried that I, I would just have to die very politely because everyone right. was like a little too embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> to sort of pray for the big stuff. Was like, don't pray for my emotions. Right. Like, pray, pray for my body so I don't die, guys. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think that's such a, it's such a tender thing, but I, um, we have so much language for it, as you well know, in the Psalms, but I just, right. I've always wanted to um, come to God with the, the great hopes and hungers we have. And to know that um, and sometimes those beautiful things come true. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we are in a not yet world and that we can pray for the courage to live here too. Let me, let me turn to some of the questions some people have, uh, have offered. One of them actually reminds me a little bit, this is by way of preface, um, there was a well-known atheist who had struggled with, you know, cancer. I, I loved how he he wrote about a lot of this, like how he felt about this or how he felt about how people talked about this. And he really took on the language of like, you know, battling cancer, that all this kind of language. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question here is from someone who says, I'm a, I'm a survivor, cancer mm -hmm. survivor as well. People say I'm heroic. I'm uncomfortable with this. How should I respond? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That is... That is such tricky language. I find some people feel very empowered by the language, but I, I agree. I've always felt um, like it didn't describe what happened and it doesn't describe what it cost or how to, how to keep doing it because all of the sort of kick cancer's butt and the victory language was, um, it felt like it was returning to a language of agency that wasn't true. I mean, most of the word to patient just means like to endure. And that is so much of the way of suffering is it's attrition and exhaustion and fear and just trying to get up and remember which dumb pills to take because you can't, right. you didn't set a timer. And I, um, so I think all the heroic language always also felt like it sort of put me on the other side of a partition in which it was okay that I was heroic because then, you know, when people say like, I can't imagine what you went through. And I'm like, gosh, I really wish you would try to imagine it a, a little. <laughs> yeah. I've always found that the hero language, I, I know it was meant as a compliment, but it, it always right. felt like it was um, uh, glamorizing something that I, I wished other people would feel the weight of a little more. Someone else has a question thinking about, um, this kind of in a different context, but um, thinking about climate change and, um, you know, wondering uh, the, the kind of things that we're wrestling with how to live, how to live together on this planet. Um, and the person made the analogy to cancer and said, do you have any thoughts of, of, of 
of, of that, how to think about that or. Yeah. I don't actually think I would <laughs> use analogies with cancer honestly, because right. people have actual cancer. I always right. feel like when it always kind of makes me feel sad, but I do think, um, I do think one of the kinds of time that we live in, uh, which, which illness helps reveal to us is apocalyptic time. And there are mm-hmm. times in scripture, a book of revelation. I mean, there's all kinds of moments that the, the end of our, of our lives, of our planet, of our time on earth is much more obvious to us. Um, and climate change is one of those things that, that, that helps sure. us. That is the perfect, um, not analogy, but true. I'm just thinking of the real, the, the right, the right word here, like a, that, that, that of a coming apocalypse and, mm-hmm. um, and that, and there is a bright clarity to that too, that I would say is different than tragic time. This kind of all comes from the work of Luke Brotherton, who's a theological ethicist. And I, I always loved when he talks about like different, the nature of different kinds of time, mm-hmm. but in apocalyptic time, when we see, um, when we see ourselves inching toward the end, um, uh, people really so i I've, I've studied american apocalypses before different responses to the experience of the end and people really go one of two ways <laughs> they they go very intensely binary and oh. um lightness and darkness and right. um and it makes them less um more certain and and um, more is at stake and therefore they're willing to sacrifice more um, or they become collectivists, which I hope we will, mm-hmm. in which we imagine that we are we are extinct without one another. So I hope it calls us to the kind of interdependence I think that's describing. Makes sense, sure. Um, and that's a hopeful, <laughs> that's a hopeful image. Um, I was intrigued in your book about uh it was striking to me when you were trying to do calculations about you know, you start counting the months and you were, you, you, because you had gotten that kind of concrete information about what you might be facing. Um, and there could be this limited horizon, but it had a kind of definite bookends to it. And so you start counting different things and you had to make choices about how to use that time. You know, are you, are you preparing for things that might be beyond the end of that, that are, that are, you know, what would, what would be the point of that versus spending time with your family or, um, how did you, how did you make decisions about all that? I, uh, I had a bit of a weird decision to make about that right away because I very inconveniently was dying right at the moment where I was supposed to be hysterically productive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if in academia, there's this, uh, timeline you get where, you have to produce a certain amount of work in a, like a, it, it has its own clock. And so I, my clocks accidentally um, were ticking at the, at yeah. the same time. So right. I was supposed to, in what was supposed to be the last year of my life, um, sort of magically somehow come up with like a 400 page, unbelievably well-researched, like bit of um, like a layered, uh, incredible insight and publish it with a major university press. And I was like, and any, any, any sane person would have been like, that's a terrible idea. I think you should just take it down a notch and spend time with your family, et cetera, et cetera. And that is probably the right answer for everybody else, except that it happens to be my vocation. Mm -hmm. It happens to be like my deepest love is writing these weirdly specific historical (laughs) books or, or writing and thinking about cultural scripts. And so I, uh, I talked to my friend, Will, who's a Bishop. Oh Mm -hmm. gosh, everyone needs a Bishop just hanging around. And, and he was, I said, well, how, how will I know if I should just kind of make more, just sort of snuggle at home plans. And he was like, Oh, well, I guess it depends if it's a career or a calling. And I, so it, the the idea that what whatever work we do, regardless of who is watching, mm-hmm. that the expression of our gifts is really good. Like the, and it's the thing for which we are made as we are made both to receive and to be. Was, was that hard for your family or did they sort of cede that the decision making, you know, to you? How did y'all I don't think anybody really wanted me around for 24 hours anyway. (laughs) What's everyone else doing? Is everyone else really busy right now? I'll just, I'll just be here quietly loving. I, uh, yeah, I I mean, I'm sure, well, I had, I had a two-year-old and, uh, so it was a big choice, 
but I, so I got up really early in the morning and I worked for, worked for the morning. And then I was, but I was the, then I put them down for a nap and I worked and I, but it, um, I think especially for women, um, there's not, there's not the sense that if you're revving the engines, that it's always, that it's necessarily healthy or good when you could be doing caretaking, nurturing, all these other things. And I realized it was the right time to not be entirely eclipsed by something I didn't choose. So, and it gave me honestly something to do rather than doing puzzles. Gosh, I am right. not built. I'm not built for puzzles. <laughs> I, so I I'm remember this part about your book where the, you know, people were kind of uh, creating these artificial encounters uh, <laughs> yeah. to Would minister you to you in the house, I guess. So, oh, a puzzle magically appears or here's uh, some lovely blankets in the other yeah, room. They're like but, swaddling yeah, me right? to prevent the use of my arms. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's a question that someone, someone, uh, watching says I'm a pediatric chaplain mm. and my oh, role is often you. to reframe hope and reframe miracles while also yeah. guiding providers in compassionate yet oh. clear language. That's, there's a lot going on Amazing. here just in that, wow. just in those wow. words. I wonder how you experience miracle language in the midst and just thinking about that as a background. Yeah, it does feel, even as someone who beliefs they exist. And, uh, I, so for instance, I, um, I had a really wonderful response to my immunotherapy drug and, uh, it shrunk a lot of my tumors to a much more manageable size. And then I had a really scary surgery that, uh, was quite successful. And I, most of my liver grew back and I'm really proud of it. It's been doing a great job (laughs) and, um, (laughs) hypertrophy didn't grow back. Um, and, uh, and it, I admit it kind of bothered me when people would say, oh, it's a miracle because the, the, the simultaneous truth was I was part of a clinical trial that was quite, um, cruel and that all kinds of pain that I went through was for no reason at all, except medical experimentation. And that I had lost so much that it felt to, it felt like the fast causality accidentally felt like it diminished the fact that I at times had saved my own life by intervening in medical decisions. And like it, 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 it felt, it, it made, I guess what I'm saying is it had the word miracle has a complicated relationship with the word agency, like our own ability to act. And so, yeah, those are, those are hard categories, our actions, God's actions to like put up right side by side. So sometimes it feels so clear to be like, thank you. What a miracle. Absolutely. And then other times I'd want a second for someone to say, um, you worked so harder than you had to, than you should have had to. I'm so sorry that happened mm-hmm. to you. And it can be about the exact same event. It seems like um, from part of your book, and tell me if I got this wrong, but you know, you were able to, it seems like you're able to keep your, your perspective when you know you you fell into the lane of the, of the, of the very few. Um, who yes. were going to, who yeah. were going to yes. do this better than it, most other people. Yeah. You, most, the yeah. vast majority, um, yes. uh, most almost all the others. Uh, almost how are you, I don't know how extreme. Yeah. No, almost everybody else extreme. died. Yeah. yeah they did. And, but you sort of didn't lose the perspective. Like that could have been you should have been you, whatever the, you know, when you think about the kind of the, the, the way that yeah. would normally work. Yeah. Um, and that you seem like you're able to keep that perspective of, you know, you know, what about the other people? You know, when I get um, homicidal though, Neil, if we can just, mm-hmm. the moments of when I get homicidal is, um, I had a moment where it was, um, I was talking about the, the struggle of the crisis of it. And then trying to, you know, just trying to live with a little more richness than the cliches I was handed. And, um, a woman stayed behind. So no, it was like, it was my most, it was, it was such a tender moment for me. I was in, I was in my own little chapel at my school at Duke Divinity school where everyone in the audience had been like friends and, and, and pastors and professors who had, who really had carried my family through this, like who prayed for me, who, put anointing oils on me, who put their hands on me and made me feel like a person again. And I felt so grateful to that community for showing me God's love in a way that I, I could never have manufactured for myself. And 
and also just wanting to say, and it has also been uh, so painful. Like what a, it has been hard. And, uh, and then a woman stayed behind the Q and A and sometimes people, um, stay behind at a book table because they want to say something private. Sometimes right. they stay behind because they want to say something really mean. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she was like, um, I'm a doctor here at the hospital and I don't really think you've been clear about how, just how lucky you've been. And the, the weight <laughs> of the word lucky as if I, um, didn't, as if I thought that I had gotten confused and I assume my life was more valuable, which I don't, or that uh, other people had saved me and that I'd, I'd failed to be grateful. Gosh, I don't know a person who suffers, who isn't also grateful, but they do need a minute to say something a little more honest than I'm always grateful. So yeah, boy, is that a lucky is like a, is a tough word. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there was, um, my wife was making thinking about this in terms of when you know are are, are people going to be okay yeah. and just yeah. thinking thinking about how um any kind of okay we receive is always temporary i mean it's never a forever thing yeah it's yes. always and i uh, and the um german theologian jürgen moltmann um talks about this too about when you do see a, an occasion of healing or an occasion of grace or whatever it is a it's it's a momentary you know glimpse of things to come but it's temporary um these things that, are did you say that was moltman yeah he talks about that okay bless you for saying um, that because i was i was <laughs> like um i was kind of buzzing around that thought recently because mm-hmm. i was i did an interview which i don't think has come out yet uh with this wonderful pastor named jerry sitzer and he had a somewhat famous especially in the mainline book about it, he he lost most members of his family in the same tragic car right. accident. Mm-hmm. And so he was kind of famous for being the person on whom we all freight the, the question, like why and what now and where's God and that kind of stuff. And, and he said, um, I mean, even if there is a miracle, he was like, I mean, Kate, like even Lazarus dies again. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, uh, I'm, sure someone else has made that point but the way he said it and mm-hmm. i thought what a lovely so i'm glad thank you for giving me that moment right really well i think it helped this sort of like why i like to read moltman because his yeah. life was not easy and it yeah. has endured a lot of suffering and i and when it comes out of that you it it just sounds it's, it's yes. easier to yeah like okay maybe i ought to take this seriously and let me ask you another question sort of here at the end a theme that we've been talking about here at Palmer this fall is uh, comes from the part in the Book of Common Prayer when we're about to celebrate communion and the priest is, uh, you know, at the um, holy table and, you know, ask everyone to lift up your hearts. And so we've been asking that in different ways and we even have a backdrop about that. And, you know, you think about a congregation gathered together contains people going through moments of joy and moments of sorrow, people who are grieving and people who are celebrating and people who have lots of questions and people uh, for whom Psalm 1 describes their life and everything's in order and others who are, you know, angry at God and all of those things and all all of those people together, we say, lift up your hearts. Uh, And so what do you, what kind of, what is, what does that look like for you? Or have you seen that? How have you experienced that? What would you? Yeah. I guess that's maybe why I kind of got obsessed with blessings is um, because I was, you know, I'd written a lot about the kind of hashtag blessed version Mm -hmm. of life in which it it means lucky, um, but you don't believe in luck and sort of um, hope that you put yourself in the right place at the right time. And I guess I've been real. So I, I write these blessings every week that try to do just try to both and the wide spectrum of it which is to say uh like this one I think this week is like uh you know like when we try to run the math of our lives but it's impossible like it doesn't add up and it was blessed are the pragmatic like those who who buttoned it up who made small plans who 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 worried like what's the point and then like blessed are the and I try it like that helps me be like and then we lift it up to the Lord like Mm -hmm. let's we bless it all because in, in, in the midst of it is the full spectrum of our, of our gorgeous 
fragile selves. And if we, we just keep practicing that kind of um, big language for our love for God and God's love for us, I think we're going to be okay. Wonderful. Thank you. On that note, I want to extend um, just such deep gratitude to you, Kate, for being with us this evening, for sharing your story with us and sharing your life with us. And um, I just want to thank everybody else um, for for joining in tonight, for being a part of this special evening. Um, I want to encourage you to check out Kate on Instagram. Uh, The blessings, she puts those on there and they're wonderful to use and you can use those in different ways. Uh, I also want to invite everybody to, while your computers are on, if you want to hop on and register for our next webinar, um, we're thrilled to invite, uh, welcome Amy Jill Levine, uh, who will be with us uh, our next um, webinar. So I'm going to put a slide up on the sh- up on the screen with that information about Amy Jill Levine, and and again in closing, thank you, Kate. Um, oh, and thank you, Neil, um, for, for tonight. Thank you so thank much you. for having me. What a you joy. are so welcome. And our, our prayers go with you and we celebrate, um, you know, Thanks. all that you bring. Thanks, my dear. So thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Take thank care. You. And I'm going to share now this screen.